so spent today. <laughs> like reading we over can... the notes, I was like, yeah, none of this is reading the in. same sentence over and over. Again. I'm reading the words, but there's nothing settling <laughs> in up here. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Middleish, the podcast about moderation and all things. I am Michael Gray. And I am Erin Green. Hi, Erin Green. Hi. How are Good you? Good afternoon. Good. It's not a morning. I was going to be like English for a minute and say, you- Good morrow, but that's not right. That wouldn't be afternoon. <laughs> what do they say for afternoon? Good afternoon. Uh, I don't. Yeah. Good afternoon. I think let's stick with that. Top of the afternoon to you. Top of the afternoon. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder how many like cultural greetings we could meld together on that one. So we could just do a podcast Probably about a that. Lot. <laughs> yeah, sounds interesting, everyone. So, yeah. Michael, I have a question for you. Fire away. Did you earn your Eagle Scout badge this week? <laughs> I did. I'm pretty did. sure. I'm pretty sure you learned how to like build a <laughs> fire in your garage and. Yeah. So for those that don't know, I, I live uh, just south of Houston, Texas. And so as of recording, not air date, but as of recording, we just had that, what was it? Arctic front or whatever move polar through the country. Polar vortex. Polar vortex. The polar there it vortex. is. That sounds more, you know, daunting. Da, da, da. Yeah, like vortex. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Polar like vortex. A sci-fi That's movie. It does, right? <laughs> the polar vortex is coming. Um, yeah. So that hit us real hard and we lost power for we here were without power for i think 64 hours and like we had lows like 16 degrees 22 degrees it was freaking cold and it's just we're not set up for that down here and yeah yeah, we just um thankfully my wife's sister they had power the whole time so Kat and the girls went and stayed with them and I was here with the animals and in case, you know, something went wrong, I wanted to be here. You have a nice and little cozy spooning session with the dogs and cat. We had some cuddles. Um, it's yeah. So we didn't have any firewood. So I'm literally like, I keep Popping telling down people, trees. <laughs> it was like a pioneer fantasy camp. <laughs> I'm like collecting <laughs> branches from my tree that are soaking wet and iced over to like oh, geez. make my fires. I had a couple of Duraflame logs, which was super helpful, but it couldn't get anything big going, you know? So it was just like the oh, small gosh. little <laughs> but radius that was kind of warm and the rest of the house. The first morning upstairs was 39, downstairs was like 43, 44 oh, degrees. Oh, wow. It was freaking cold. Yeah. And then we had to shut our water off because everybody's pipes were bursting. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It was weird. I'd you know, get up in the morning and I'd like, thankfully I have a gas stove, which was, oh, thank goodness. Oh yeah. At least you I'd could like have your coffee. Boil some water and run it through my coffee thing and then boil it again and run it through like four times. Just to and get then fill the bathtub with boiling water. And <laughs> It was stupid. It was ridiculous. Oh man. But um, yeah, we got power on now. We've had heat for a little over a day. Um, we've been under a boil water notice and one of the neighboring towns, they just got removed from that. So hopefully we're not too far behind and we can start getting out of this mess. But but heat and water on is infinitely better than it was. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It was hard to watch just being so removed from it, you know, Mm -hmm. in Idaho. But then like I I texted you, I think almost every day this week going like, so how are you doing? Do you have power yet? Whatever. And if I didn't hear back, I'd just assume I'm like, well, you know, Kat and the girls are checking in with him and he's good and he'll survive, you know, he's good. (laughs) But what if something happens? Now I got to get a new (laughs) co-host. Yeah. I better start interviewing people. Oh boy. Well, I've heard from Michael for a few hours. Who's interested. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Never a dull moment in, I mean, ever since. Yeah this decade started, it's been like, what, what, it's been <laughs> what's going to happen next? Come at me, bro. <laughs> Bring keep, it. Keep telling people I felt like a squatter in my own house, you know, <laughs> like no yeah. power and <laughs> like oh one little gosh. lantern and fire and sleeping under 10 blankets. And yeah, but 
One, one of my friends told me that they lost power over Christmas when they were visiting family, Mm -hmm. um, in another state. And she was like, well, we had, I mean, they had this, you know, not a house full, but they had dogs and they had her, you know, some other family members and cousins and stuff there. Mm -hmm. And they, the only source of heat was, and this is like in the Rocky mountains. And so it's super freaking cold. But the only source of heat was their gas oven and stove. And so they just crank it and turn it on. I was like, ah, that's not exactly safe. Leave the oven door open and just like Yikes. turn it on. And I, I was like, I don't know about that, but you might not wake up. Um, <clears throat> desperate times, I guess. And that, I mean, that's all joking set aside that that was mentioned several times on the news is how desperate people were to stay warm and, and to try and heat their homes. And unfortunately it resulted in some really dangerous situations. So I I Um, went to Walmart a couple of days ago to just get some like canned goods and try to find some dog food and had to wait in line for a while. And it was pretty picked over, but I did see like lots of people leaving with like charcoal. And I was like, Oh God, I hope you're not burning that in your house to stay warm. Oh geez. Yeah. I hope you're cooking, not using that to cook on the grill outside and not to stay warm because you're going to die. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's something you don't really think about with just that kind of knowledge that people might have, you know, where you have lived somewhere that has very cold seasons. And so you kind of know the do's and don'ts of keeping your house warm or, you know, using certain things inside versus someone who's never encountered that before. And they might be like, oh yeah, we'll just do this thing. And it results in a disaster. So yeah, for sure. Well, I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're safe and I'm glad that you have power and that you're, you know, not completely zombified, but we're going to, we're going to get through this podcast. (laughs) (laughs) How was your week? (laughs) My week was fine. I'm not going to tell you anything <laughs> about the snowfall that we had because it's nothing compared to what you experienced. You guys have a lot but, of snow though, don't you? Well, we, we actually got quite a bit this last weekend, but, uh, it quickly melted off and turned oh, to okay. rain like it does in Boise. Yeah. And we were supposed to get more Definitely. last night and then it just turned to rain, um, you know, in the early morning hours. So we're actually in decent shape here. Yeah. Um, my week has been, you know, not as busy as previous weeks, but, um, I'm doing my year end stuff for my bookkeeping, Mm. which is like the, the bane of my existence. I'm, I'm good at math when it comes to nutrition, when it comes to like bookkeeping (laughs) and just understanding how QuickBooks and that works. I, there were tears, (laughs) let's just say that, but I did find somebody to, to help me. And that's something every year I go through this and I could really be better at you know, consistently kind of managing it throughout the year, but because I hate doing it, I put it off and then Mm. I do it all before tax season. And guess what, Aaron, you'd think you'd learn after six years of doing it this way, that it's not the best way to do it. I'm working on my 13th and I still do it that way. So, (laughs) okay. I don't feel so (laughs) stupid anymore. Yeah. Uh, Well, good. Good, Mm -hmm. good. Yeah. Not a bad week. Good. So, um, this is a very timely topic because I'm actually making a stir fry with some tofu tonight for dinner. I've got nice. it marinating just before we hopped on here. I was like, oh yeah, get that plant-based meal going. Do nice. you cook with much tofu? I have never cooked with tofu. <gasps> New food for Michael. Yep. When you said that, I was like, all right, I got to try it because we yeah. love stir fry. In fact, we just had it Sunday or Saturday, right before everything went south. We had some chicken stir fry that was yeah. delicious. But, I'll just yeah. kick this off by saying that tofu, I think the texture of it is really off-putting for some people because it's such a spongy, um, foreign looking thing. You know, it comes in a block or like mm-hmm. a cake and really all it is soybeans that have been soaked and, right. and mashed into, you know, a, a cake, a gel kind of form. Um, and one of my friends tried it years ago when I, I was like, she had two dietitians in the room and she had no choice, but to try new food, (laughs) she kind of takes a little nibble and she goes, Oh, it's the texture of kind of an egg. And I'm like, exactly right. Like a scrambled egg, you know, that kind of almost spongy anyway. Mm -hmm. So, um, we're talking about plant-based eating plant-based diets today, plant-based diets. And there's a lot more to it than just tofu. This is true. (laughs) 
which I, th- I think a lot of people are probably like, well, you lost me, Aaron. I'm not giving up my meat. <laughs> don't, don't walk away yet. Don't hit, tofu. Yeah, don't hit stop yet. Yeah. <laughs> Skip. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about this because, um, it's a, definitely a trend. We're hearing more and more uh, conversation around plant-based. Uh, there's different forms, which we'll go into in a second, the definition of all these different diets. Mm-hmm. But I, I actually run into a lot of clients that are interested in trying this way of eating and um, a lot of teenagers actually that are really getting into the whole vegetarian mm-hmm. realm And, um, you know, we hear a lot of stuff in the media about meat, red meat, specifically agriculture, environmental concerns. And there's a lot of products in the food Mm -hmm. world now that are very much like this is, you know, vegan or plant-based or plant-based protein is another big thing. Right. It's really been gaining a lot of steam. Well, I think like it's been gaining steam for a long time, but it's Mm -hmm. just sort of been this steady trajectory. And now you're seeing like beyond meat everywhere. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, restaurants have it, every store has it, you know, it's like all over the place. And you see like, um, you know, like um, veggie chips and, you know, snacks and that are just all vegetable. And it's really gaining a lot of steam lately. It feels like to me, you know. Yeah. And I think, I mean, you just listed a whole bunch of like the food industry, Mm -hmm. you know, the food industry often drives these trends. And it's funny because consumers think they're sort of in the driver's seat. And, and in some ways we are, I mean, what consumers are looking for is what the, the food companies will definitely follow that, but it also, you know, the food companies can create that demand too, just by getting on some kind of a projection of a trend, like, Mm -hmm. Oh, I see that plant-based is kind of taking hold. So we're going to start developing and pivoting our you know, product line to include more of this so that we can always hit that consumer target. So the food industry is huge in this. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, when it comes to like the beyond meat and the, have you tried those by the way? I haven't. Are they good? Do you like, they're good. I've had like veggie burgers, um, Mm -hmm. and veggie, like some sort of fake chicken. I don't know if it's like a chicken nugget or chicken strip and Mm -hmm. they're okay. Um, but uh, I've had like black bean based burgers before and they're good. Yeah. Different. You can't expect mm-hmm. a hamburger, but they're, they were mm-hmm. good. You know? Yeah. Um, the, the thing about the beyond meat and what's the other brand I'm trying to think of off the top of my head. That's a, um, um I won't think of it. It's been around for a while. Right. Yeah. It's a, um, there's another, there's another meat alternative burger. Um, they're, I think they're very believable in terms of I've tried the crumbles. I've tried the burgers. I've tried the meatballs and they're very believable, uh, in terms of texture, flavor, uh, no, that's, that's that's more of a plant-based, um, so those oh, ones like beyond like the, burger impossible. Yeah. That's what it is. The impossible burger. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's, yeah, two okay. different I ones. Gotcha. Um, but then like Morningstar farms or, or garden burger or some of those other brands to me, that's just kind of like a savory veggie cake or product, you know, veggie bean product. And so it doesn't taste like meat. These other products that are coming out actually taste more like meat and reading about, I, I think it's the impossible burger that, um, goes through the actual food science of how they make these compounds taste like the compounds Mm -hmm. that we get in a savory charred meat kind of flavor. And it's really fascinating because it's all about science and chemistry. Well, I'm looking at it right now and they're in packages like ground beef would be. Yeah. Yeah. Which is odd. It looks like raw Mm -hmm. meat. Yeah. So, and I, I, I do appreciate the movement in that direction. And I do support companies finding innovative ways to hit that mark. Mm -hmm. Um, but we'll talk about some of the trade-offs to that and some of the misconceptions I think that are out there when it comes to, you know, switching over to a plant-based diet. So let's, um, let's talk about definitions here. Probably the most common, I think that people here and are familiar with is vegetarian, just a standard vegetarian diet. Uh, excludes animal products, um, sorry, meat on the whole, but then includes things like uh, dairy, eggs, eggs, sometimes some fish, 
Um, and there's different, you know, levels of vegetarianism or, or mm. different categories. So there's like lacto vegetarian eats eggs, but doesn't eat dairy or any meats or other animal products. And then there's lacto ovo that includes, um, or did I just say lacto? I probably just screwed that up. Didn't I? So well, lacto includes lacto. dairy, but no eggs. Lacto ovo includes dairy and eggs. Right. And then okay. just ovo vegetarian is just eggs. <laughs> right. So getting into my Latin descriptions here. <laughs> um, and then there's pescatarian. You can tell why this is confusing because there's so many different labels for. I know that one. They eat fish, right? Pescatarians. That's, yeah. Good job. And me. it may or may not include. Star. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> yeah. Michael, why don't you just keep going? You're on a roll. That's my win for the day. All right. Pescatarians. Um, <laughs> so they eat fish. Like salmon um, and tuna and tilapia. Right. And you may or may not include, you know, the whole lacto ovo components, the milk and the egg components to that, mm. but generally not eating any land animals um, under that pescatarian label. And then does that vegan, include like shrimp, lobster? Do they include that? Mussels, oysters? Yeah, as far as I know. Okay. And then under the traditional definition, of course, we'll, we'll kind of get into this labeling conundrum and why this is so challenging for people. And then vegan, of course, is yeah. um, devoid of all animal products and a vegan lifestyle actually embraces devoid of all animal no derivatives leather, whatsoever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fabrics, um, yeah. And one thing I didn't realize when uh, you know years ago, when I was kind of learning about all these different types of plant-based or, or meat free movements is that, um, honey is excluded in a vegan diet. And right. I didn't really, yeah, I know it's surprising, uh, isn't it? Because I didn't really understand why it worked so hard for it. Right. The but then I was like, well, why not yeast? Like, you know, yeast is a living being yeah. and why not, you know, other things that have cultures in them, like mm -hmm. kimchi or something, or you know, I just, I started, yeah, yeah, I started kind of like guessing about this. And one of my friends explained that if it's a sentient being that is producing the product, that is the exclusion. Yeah. But I watched a documentary called more than honey. I think it was on Netflix or something. Matt and I watched it and it talks about honeybees and their behaviors and how freaking smart they are and crazy smart it's and ridiculous vital. and how they learn they they actually are capable of like learning and and evolving in a manner that really puts them more in a place of like you know mammals and you know not what mm. we would traditionally think about insects and I mean, just insect, survival yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah incredibly intelligent um, creatures yeah and to get honey from them in in the i would say in the widespread honey industry, you know, the mass produced honey industry, it's not an ethical practice a lot of the times. And so they, mm. this documentary kind of went through the steps of that. And I was like, Oh, I totally get it now. Why someone, you know, who is very interested in ethical practices when it comes to agriculture and treatment of animals and treatment of the earth would really have take issue with honey. Mm -hmm. Um, on the flip side, uh, there are very responsible beekeepers and, and people who produce honey in sure. um, sustainable and ethical ways Humane too. Ways, so that's yeah. a, yeah. So that was an interesting one too, that I learned. So, hmm. I did so not those know are that. the, mm -hmm. yeah, more than honey is the, okay. the documentary check that out. more than honey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, so those are the main vegetarian labels, I would say. Now we also have, you know, some other labels to think about. So WFPB, whole foods, plant-based. That sounds like a, a, a wrestling federation or something. You got the WWF, <laughs> the WWE, the WFPB. <laughs> right. So this one was, I didn't know what this was until I actually had a homestay with a family when I was racing professionally. And, you know, you get this email um, introduction to them. And we were kind mm -hmm. of going back and forth. And of course, food is one of the things we talk about. And the, um, my host said, you know, as far as groceries, we can have anything you need here, but we are a WFPB. So blah, blah, blah. And I was like, what is that? Cause I, I'm a dietitian and I don't even mm -hmm. know that diet. Like what the hell is that? And so I started Googling, and of course it stands for whole food, whole foods, plant-based. And it's 
more of a lifestyle than a diet is how it's purported. There's, I haven't found a clear definitive definition, but it's very much on terms with vegetarianism yet with like a little bit more, um, emphasis on reducing, you know, added sugars and, um, minimally Mm. processed foods. So that's where the whole foods thing comes in. And, um, you know, there's, there's a few more kind of guidelines around it. Um, I would also say that it tends to steer a little more toward that high protein, high fat, low carb kind of realm. Um, so that was another one that, uh, Mm -hmm. was again, like all of these labels kind of have these nuanced sort of rules and, and guidelines. Huh. That sounds Um, familiar. I know, which we, (laughs) have we, have we talked about that maybe once? Maybe, maybe we should make a podcast about that. Maybe we have. (laughs) (laughs) So other plant-based eating patterns that you might, um, you've probably heard of the Mediterranean diet, which I'm a huge proponent of because it doesn't eliminate a specific food group at all. Everything is included. Yep. Totally. To me, that's such a big difference with an eating approach. Like it's excluding and emphasizing, God, they're so different, you know, Mm -hmm. like, because if you can say, like we've said a million times, yeah, still eat this stuff, but really prioritize these things. Like if we can just prioritize some fruits and vegetables and lean proteins, man, like, I feel like everyone would be so much better off, you know, but you can still eat, you know, ice cream or Twinkies if you want, but let's really put a focus on, on these things. There's such a big difference. And that's why I, I really never had a beef with the Mediterranean diet either, because there's really no exclusion. It's like, I, I just try to get a there. lot of that stuff. Oh, I, I didn't see what you did it. there. I, that was accidental. I see how witty you are. Even when you're a zombie, even in my like delirium, man, I am still <laughs> so funny. <laughs> still got it. And so humble. Yeah. Well, so yeah, I, I agree with you. The Mediterranean diet is definitely about emphasis. And yeah. so is another one called the flexitarian mm-hmm. diet, which I've also heard called semi-vegetarian. And basically it's eat mostly fruits and vegetables, like really make that the focus legumes and whole grains, you know, really include those foods Mm -hmm. and then be flexible about how much and how often you incorporate meats, fish, dairy, eggs, you know, all of these other things. And it really emphasizes, I mean, yes, it, it also says limit added sugars and sweets as much as you can. Um, but there's no like rules of exclusion with this one either. Um, and to eat the less processed, uh, foods as well, which, you know, I, I think this is where people get really confused because they're like, well, you know, we just went from like some of the most exclusive types of plant-based diets, like veganism Mm -hmm. or, you know, excluding certain food groups, um, to a more kind of liberal, flexible approach. And guess what? This is almost identical to the dietary guidelines for Americans, which is our, you know, every five years, we have this, you know, review board of experts in the industry and, and several stakeholders that, you know, agencies that have vested interest in the health of our communities. And they come up with these dietary guidelines and people think that they're crap because, Oh, it, you know, the, the, my plate has grains on it and the food uh, pyramid has carbs grains on the there. <laughs> I know. Obviously, we like, still say to drink dairy. Oh my gosh. They're all shills for the grain right. industry because there's carbs on here. <laughs> and my <Yet>. friend Becky. <laughs> Karen, I want to talk to the manager of the DGAs. She's an executive director of Keto Works. And <laughs> <laughs> so we, we kid, we kid. But at the same time, we're kind of serious because, (laughs) because these guidelines come out every five years and people still poo poo them and they have to come up with their own like fandangled foo-foo-y definition or explanation of things. And we can't just agree that the dietary guidelines have a ton of flexibility within them and that a vegetarian eating pattern, or even a vegan eating pattern, those are fine eating patterns as well. 
if, if you choose to eat that way, right. totally go for it. There is a ton of research and we'll get into some of that, that talks about the benefits of, you know, vegetarian or, or vegan eating patterns or any variation of those. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there's also a, a ton of research that shows that just putting an emphasis on plant foods right. rather than an emphasis on animal foods, which is what the Western diet has, has steered toward over the years with yeah. industry and, and agriculture and just the way our food system is right. geared. Um, if people were to emphasize plants more, the inclusion of plants and the increase in plant foods in the diet is right. where the benefit truly lies. Tremendous so. benefit. Yeah. Well, and I just, you know, again, I mean, I, I, maybe I'm just going to, maybe my role this episode is just recapping other episodes. <laughs> but <laughs> I remember when we talked about this, um, but we've said it before, you know, like that's why it's so important to, for it to be individualized. Like, what do you like? What do you feel God on? You know, how do you prefer to eat? Like eat how you want and just don't be a dick about it. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> yeah, let exactly. other people eat how they want to. <laughs> like if you get to eat how you want, can I eat how I want and that be okay? You know, right. um, it just, it just gets so weird how it just has to be so dogmatic, you know? Mm -hmm. And as opposed to just like, yeah, you know, like here are some good guidelines, but enjoy it too. Make it work for you. What works for you? And it just doesn't happen. Yeah. And I, I think this speaks to why, I mean, I just went through the labels and I even got a little bit, you know, tongue twisted with, with describing them and going through everything. Um, but I think it, it just emphasizes why we have to have diet labels in the first place. It's sort of this belonging to a club and this piece right. of your identity Tribalism. that you want to. Yeah. yeah. And, and with plant-based eating, um, I mean, there are so many variations of that, even when you go into the literature and, and I did a presentation on this last spring. Um, and I went into the literature specifically on plant-based, you know, vegetarian, vegan, you know, going through all this stuff. And man, there is, there's a lot of disagreement on what is plant-based or what is, you know, this, the research that talks about limiting, um, animal foods, again, limiting or decreasing or de-emphasizing. There's all of these different um, terms that are used in the literature. So it's right. really, really difficult to actually pin down. Like mm -hmm. this is the best, this is the best approach. Yeah. But people well, want to label it. Right. And that's the weird thing about these labels is it's just like, it gets me thinking like, what's the point of having a label? Like, mm -hmm. I don't like lobster, like, right? Like, I don't really like seafood that much. I don't, I don't have, label myself as someone like I have to have a special title. I'm this, I'm anti, you know, You're crustacean. A flex it, it anti-lobster Aryan. I don't right? know. Like, like even <laughs> just going back to the vegetarian, it's like, okay, so we have vegetarian and we have lacto vegetarian. We have lacto ovo vegetarian. We have, you know, it's just like, Oh God, <laughs> like, I know. How about you just eat what you like and you don't eat what you right. don't want to eat. And then we're just all people who are eating. And right. it's just, it's just such an odd thing how much we really have to feel like we're, we got other people behind us. You know, we got to really feel like what I'm, the decisions I'm making are backed by other people's decisions that match mine. And mm -hmm. as opposed to just like, and I don't know what that is. I don't know if that's industry fueled. I don't know if that's just something innate with people, but but there really is something to that identity and that tribalism and part of a belonging to something, you know, there are other people mm -hmm. that, that feel the exact same way that I do eat the same way I do believe the same things I do, as opposed to just like, which was frustrating because then it, it, it paints everyone there, like with a really broad brush and that's right. just not the way it works. You right. know, um, I could say I'm whatever, but you know, I mean, whether you're say, you know, conservative or liberal. Well, there's a million variations under right. those umbrellas. So yes, what's the point. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like, I mean, I think it's, I think it's helpful for people to have their own, you know, guardrails and boundaries are helpful for people. So if you have found a way of 
eating that works well for you. Or if, I mean, I know a lot of people that have ethical concerns around the environment and our agricultural industry and animal treatment. I'm totally on board with that. And when a client comes to me and, you know, expresses some of those reasons, that's really powerful information for me as a practitioner, because then I know like where they've put their kind of guardrails and their boundaries for themselves. And we can then move forward with it versus if, if somebody is like, I just want to, this is, I read about this specific diet and this is the way to eat. And this is going to make me healthier, or it's going to cause me to lose weight, or it's going to be, you know, better for the environment and, and not having an actual, I don't know, more, more, a little more context to yeah. the why and, and maybe some of the gray area right. within that. Mm-hmm. I think that's where people get yeah. confused. And I wonder if that comes about from mm-hmm. like an, a, a need to package and sell it as a thing, you know, oh, like, sure. yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of it because there's books and there's diet plans and there's right. food products. And, yeah. you know, so there's, there's a whole industry that thrives on putting a label on something. So it's really right. easy for somebody to choose that, that right. product or that way of eating. Um, I, okay. yeah, I, I was just going to say that, um, I actually tried a vegan diet for 30 days Mm -hmm. years ago after it was, it was after my final race of the season. And the reason I did it was because I, I needed kind of a personal and professional challenge to relate to some of my clients that have to go through some kind of elimination, like a forced elimination because of an allergy or they get diabetes. And so all of a sudden they're forced to totally overhaul their diet in a Mm -hmm. way that makes them read labels and suddenly take this interest in food. And so I started thinking about, you know, this would kind of be a fun project for me to do. And what would be a way that I have to do this that would really force me into something that's more difficult where I would have to really think about how I make food and plan food and buy food. Right. And so I did this vegan diet for 30 days and it it's a challenge. I mean, even for me, I because- bet. I, I remember like getting duped. Like I read this cheese label a thousand times. It was like, yeah, it's an almond based cheese. Well, it ended up having casein in it, which Uh, is a milk protein, which first of all, I was like, who the hell decided that casein (laughs) belongs in an almond cheese dicks because then you trip up even someone like me. But then just the fact that I like, I really made an effort to make the quote right decisions. And I still got tripped up with certain, certain things. So um, it, it was a great learning experience for me because it built a ton of empathy with, you know, understanding sure. where clients come from, if they do have to go into some kind of a special diet situation mm-hmm. or they get diagnosed with something. Um, but then it also made me realize like how much of a racket it could be to just really draw that hard line. If you don't have a real tangible reason for it, you know, right. Other than then hoping this is the thing that's going to work for me. Yeah. You know, which again, just goes back to just how, you know, I mean, none of these, if, if you're approaching any kind of eating pattern, including a plant, a higher plant-based one, like there's a lot of crap out there that's plant-based, right? There's a lot of (laughs) super processed stuff. Oreos are vegan, right? Yeah. So (laughs) aren't Snickers too, I think are vegan. Uh, or maybe they're gluten-free. They're gluten-free. Yeah. Um, but donuts, like, the little donuts are, are vegan. See, it's, healthy. it's crazy. Yeah. Health food. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the takeaway for today. Donuts beer, are health food. Beer is vegan. <clears throat> you know? uh, yeah. Uh, um, what was I saying? Something. I was saying something. Oh, but there's like, a lot of crap that you can eat out there. Yeah. And, and, uh, if you have a, you know, a moral, there's a ethical reasons behind pursuing something like this. Great. Awesome. Like that's a really strong why to do this, right? Like that's a really good reason. You're probably going to really sink into this. If you really firmly believe that uh, this is, I just, I don't feel right about, you know, that the, the meat industry, the animal industry and how they're treated and stuff. Great. But if it's just like, mm, well, maybe I'll be able to lose weight that way. Yeah. It's like, it doesn't matter how you try it. You got to deal with what's going on inside. You got to deal with the reason that you eat, you know, process stuff 99% of the time and you can't seem to get yourself to eat an apple, you know, like that's the stuff Mm -hmm. you need to deal with because this isn't an answer. 
Yeah. And people often fall into the either, or the black and white Mm -hmm. thinking, you know, I'm either following this plant-based diet or Mm -hmm. I'm eating that other way. Mm-hmm. And there's no gray area mm-hmm. where, you know, just to get into some of the research, um, man, I, I poured through the literature. Like I did a full on lit review on this presentation. Um, cause I'm presenting to dietitians, And so you better know your stuff because there's going to be some tough questions. Mm-hmm. Um, but the literature was really, really clear on one thing add more plant foods to the diet. We all should be eating more plants. And that is, I mean, irrefutable in a lot of ways. I know that the carnivore diet people would probably shred me with that claim. Um, well, attempt to. <laughs> attempt to. They'd, they'd attempt to. Yeah, there's I not much I'd to have, back I think that. I'd have yeah. enough ammo. Yeah, you'd be um, fine. <laughs> <laughs> but, but really, the, the research is so... Um, I wouldn't say it's, it's conflicted, but it's so unclear with the exact right way to execute a plant-based diet. There's so many different variations. There's no clear cut definition that actually says this is the way to go. So, um, there was one physician's update that I read that's from a few years ago that was like, physicians should steer away from the terms vegetarian or vegan when talking to patients about a healthful diet for say like heart disease or cancer prevention Mm -hmm. or stroke risk. Um, and really just start talking about whole foods and including more plant foods in the diet and just try and leave the labels out of it. And just talk to your patients about something that they can actually relate to, which is include more plant foods. I mean, most people most adults can <laughs> probably <laughs> determine which foods come from animals and which ones come from plants on the whole, you would hope there's, there's hope. still a lot of confusion out there. <laughs> well, there is. And then there's, I mean, it's just, you know, and, and I think a lot of that is this industry who just tries to, to capitalize on anything they possibly can. And so you have like, like things like a green supplement, you know, like that can be great. You know, it shouldn't be the only place you're getting, you know, like plants right. from, or, you know, your, your, your plant-based, you know, chips or crisps or whatever, like, okay, cool. You're going to get some more plants. It's still super processed, right? Like I've had mm-hmm. clients ask like, Hey, does this count? And I'm like, you know what, if that's where we got to start, great. Let's start with right. those. And let's start with, you know, canned veggies or uh, green supplement or cool. You know, that's great because better is better, but this isn't where we should end up. You know, we really should yeah. be working towards actual eating actual plants, you know, but it can be confusing because you see a bag of, you know, ranch, you know, vegetarian, mm-hmm. whatever. And it's like, oh, these are veggies, you know, mm-hmm. 10 servings of vegetables and one, you know, whatever. Right. And it's like, oh, that's awesome. And it's delicious. That's way better than Brussels sprouts or asparagus. So I can do that. Right. It's like, well, yeah, but also no, you know, yeah. and it just gets so it, I understand why people are confused. I totally get it, but, um, it's just, it can be really frustrating. I think. Yeah. As, and, you know, and watch out. Position. Yeah, totally. And watch out for those marketing claims. Like you were saying, like with the veggie chips, you know, that say, Oh, this many servings of veggies and a serving of these chips or whatever. But if you turn it over on the back, the first ingredient is usually potato starch. So they're potato chips. I mean, they have some coloring in them, but to really get like a serving of spinach or carrots or whatever. Um, and it ain't the same, you guys, it's not the same as (laughs) as eating some, you know, sauteed spinach or something. Yeah. Is it Um, better? Probably, but it has a ways to go. (laughs) Well, and I think this is an interesting point. And one that I came across quite a bit in the literature I was reading is there is a difference between, I mean, some of these studies really investigated people who were vegetarian or health conscious meat eaters, health conscious, Mm non-vegetarians. And when we hear that term health conscious, of course, that's another kind of gray area. What does that mean? But the hard thing is a lot of people that engage in a vegetarian diet on the whole, they really do a very good job of, you know, whole foods, uh, really getting the fruits and veggies and like that, those core, you know, legumes, whole grains, um, 
using animal foods in, in moderation or, or in very limited quantities. Um, but then you also get, you know, people that again, kind of ascribe to that label, but then they don't, they're not health conscious about it. So they are going right. for it, the processed stuff that you just listed, or, you know, the, the shortcuts, like the packaged meals that just have, you know, vegetarian slapped on them or plant-based slapped mm-hmm. on them. Um, versus if you take and compare, you know, some of those vegetarians to a health conscious non-vegetarian. So somebody who does include meat and eggs, you know, fairly regularly, but they also have an abundance of plant foods in their diet. They there's really no difference in health risk in this one study I'm looking at that for colorectal stomach, lung, prostate, and breast cancers and stroke, no difference in, um, mortality between vegetarians Mm. and these health conscious non-vegetarians. So again, those authors concluded like ample consumption of fruits and vegetables is the key here. So when you get those people that say, Oh, I'm vegetarian. And all they're eating is like, you know, fries with cheese on them or a vegetarian chili slathered on them or whatever, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, or cookies that are vegetarian. It just, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't jive. It's not the same. Which I think it's just, it brings out the point. It's just really important to look at not only what are you eating, but what are you not eating, you know? And I, and because a lot of times it's not just about what you're eating. It's about what you don't eat at all or what you eat very rarely, you know? And I mean, it's not uncommon for me to start to work with a client and it's like, Hey, you know, let's, let's keep a, a food journal for a few days, just kind of see where things are at. And, you know, three or four days, they, they, later they turn this in. It's like, there's not a vegetable to be seen. That's, that's not uncommon at all, you know? And so sure. Could they reduce some of these other things? Yeah, that's absolutely. You know, I mean, less chicken nuggets and, you know, frozen stuff or whatever. Sure. But also, man, what if you just kept eating that stuff, but you started adding plants to your diet, you're, you're going to be in a lot better position, you know, um, just by beginning to include things that you're missing you know? Well, and I like that you pointed that out because our society is so geared toward elimination of things. What should you be eating less of instead of what should I be eating more of? And when people come to me and say, Oh, I felt so much better when I stopped eating this. Usually my follow-up question is what were you eating instead? (laughs) You know, what did you fill that void with? Absolutely. Uh, Because most humans will find something to replace that food with. And Mm -hmm. I, I get that, you know, it, it forces you to rethink your diet if you're eliminating certain things, but man, it, it also causes this really rigid mindset of you don't really pay attention to what to do instead. Right. Yeah. Yep. And that's why one of my, one of my favorite approaches to start with people is like, we're not going to focus on what you're going to restrict. We're not going to, we're not going to, we're not even going to talk about that. We're not going to subtract anything. We're just going to add, keep doing what you're doing. Let's get two vegetables in a day. You know, let's get two servings of veggies. And because one, I think what you start saying, Hey, we're going to subtract this instantly. We're in that oh negative food. This food's bad. Yeah. Where it's feeding that cycle of bad relationship with food, you know, and that whole mess that that can be. And it takes all of it off that, all the emphasis emphasis on that and puts it on, here are some things that are good for me that I want to get more of because they're good for me. Mm -hmm. And then people realize, oh, I actually kind of like this stuff. Oh, I'm eating more of these. So it kind of takes place and it's pushing some of that other stuff. I'm not eating quite as much. And it keeps just a really good, healthy relationship with food too. Yep. Yeah. Um, And on that same vein, you know, that, that kind of healthy relationship with food and, and understanding, you know, how we, how we label our, our eating patterns, if you want to put a label on them. Um, I read this great article by Dr. David Katz, who is, man, I think he's out of Yale, um, a leader in public health research. Um, he's just, he's, he's been on a lot of the committees for like dietary guidelines and things over the years. And he just has a really grounded and pragmatic approach to health and nutrition. And he's able to take like these very, um, data driven concepts and translate them into behaviors and actions and recommendations for just like, you know, community for public health. 
and he did this review of these different diets. Um, this was back in 2014. So a while ago, um, but he, he compares, he has this table where he compares low carbohydrate diet, low fat slash vegetarian slash vegan diet, low glycemic Mediterranean, a mixed or balanced diet, which would probably be a little more of like a flexitarian or, you know, DGA mm-hmm. and the paleo diet. So he took all of these, there's like six labels. And one of them, the low fat vegetarian vegan actually includes three. And basically he kind of talks about like, here are the health benefits related to these different aspects of each diet. And it's a lot of like restriction of refined sugars and starches and, um, you know, minimally processed foods and an emphasis on whole plant foods. And basically he, he says like the compatible elements of all of these is, you know, some of those things I just listed limited, um, specific fats, you know, some fats that are associated with, you know, health outcomes, um, but may or may not include fish, poultry, meat. And in the end, um, he quotes Michael Pollan, which I don't know if you've heard of Mm -hmm. Michael Pollan. Oh yeah fabulous writer. And just, Mm -hmm. he has, we're actually rewatching his documentary cooked on Netflix right now. Super good. So if, if you all are looking for somebody to write about food and really present Mm -hmm. it in a fantastic way from also like a social cultural standpoint, Michael Pollan is wonderful. It's really good. He likes to say eat food, but not too much. And mostly plants, mostly plants. Yep. Very simple. Mm -hmm. There's no elimination there. There's no like weird relationship with food that you have to adopt or that you have to tell yourself and you don't have to give up, you know, your favorite, you know, childhood meal that includes cheese or meat or something. Mm. So eat food, not too much, mostly plants, pretty simple. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I remember watching, is it cooked? Does he have another documentary? I feel like I watched something, but I didn't I think, think it was cooked, cooked. It might be his only one. Did he have a series? I don't know. It was something, but I remember watching that and, and that instantly stuck in my head mm-hmm. and I haven't watched it for a few years at least. And as soon as you started, it was like, Oh yeah, I remember that. It just, it's yeah. something that sticks with you and it's really good. Yeah. He's, he's fantastic. He also wrote the omnivores dilemma <laughs> and, um, in defense of food was another mm-hmm. one. That's a really good documentary. I think that one, I haven't seen it on Netflix, but he, he essentially talks about the evolution of the food industry and what has happened over the years and how we have gotten to this place. And and there are a lot of researchers actually that really investigate how the food industry plays a role in some of our misconceptions around food and some of our like jacked up belief systems around food and, and just, and why we have movements like vegetarianism and and plant-based diets, because we as a Western culture have entirely focused too much on meat Mm -hmm. and the abundance of meat and animal foods for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And we, we know this, we're seeing it in, in the literature. Mm -hmm. So that's not really in dispute. It's just this whole, like either or elimination label kind of thing that I think people get really screwed up on. And then also, I mean, if you're paying attention to added sugars, or if you're paying attention to carbohydrates and you're paying attention to all these other elements too, but then you also want to do a vegan diet, then maybe you want to do raw and non GMO, but then maybe you want, I mean, all of a sudden we get into this really, really convoluted and probably, (laughs) probably super complicated and unsustainable manner of eating. Mm -hmm. And, and you see this tug of war within the diet industry. That's like, this one's better. Well, our way is better. Well, Mm -hmm. this one has this research. And let me just tell you, anybody who's watched game changers, the documentary, there's a lot of cherry picked research in that documentary. Um, it's, it's propaganda. He's, mm-hmm. he's selling a belief system that he really believes in a and he has intent to uh, making the movie totally. to reinforce what he believes. Yeah, totally. Yeah, um, and painful. which, yeah, which, which brings me into, you know, some of the practical application of some of these diets, you know, speaking about nutrition and protein and certain micronutrients and, um, you know, the nutrient adequacy of the diet, that's a mm-hmm. whole different conversation that people aren't having because they're just, I mean, anybody can start doing a vegetarian diet if they want to, or, or whatever diet they want, but don't quite understand that if you do start eliminating foods, um, you need to 
find those nutrients elsewhere and make sure that you're well balanced. So, right. so, um, I think we're probably going to wrap up soon, but I want to ask you this because I think a common concern from people, um, is like pursuing something that is more heavily plant-based or a vegetarian type diet or vegan diet or, you know, omni vegan, all those labels, vegan, or can you whatever. list, list them all? <laughs> yeah, I can't. Cause they're written right in front of me. <laughs> 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 Otherwise I couldn't, but is, okay. So how, where do I get enough quality protein in my diet? So mm-hmm. looking at more plant-based sources, what are kind of your top few, like great places to get good quality protein from plant-based sources besides beans? Well, uh, why'd you say beside beans? Because I, think- I wanted to sound smart too. <laughs> beans Doesn't and legumes. very often. <laughs> <laughs> especially today beans, guys, beans, beans. And, <laughs> beans and legumes are i think sadly one of the most under consumed and under celebrated food sources Underrated i mean they're far. super ch- they're super cheap they are like a multitasking food because they've got carbohydrates and fiber and protein and mm-hmm. iron and they're so good for your gut and they're very mm-hmm. filling and they're versatile like there's just a thousand things i could sing the praises of the magical fruit um, and lentils, lentils are another one. I know. I just had Look, to I can make song laugh. in my head. Beans, beans, <laughs> the magical fruit. <laughs> um, other sources of protein. I mean, soy is, is obviously one of the top of the list for plant-based mm-hmm. proteins because it does, it's a complete protein source. So we talk about the amino acid profile in complete versus incomplete proteins. And just so you People know if you are following a plant-based or vegetarian or vegan diet, if you're getting a variety of various protein sources throughout the day, you don't have to do the pairing of proteins that we used to talk about, you know, where you have like this incomplete protein with this incomplete protein, like rice and beans. Um, you actually, as long as you're getting a variety throughout the day, you're, you're usually good with your amino acid profile. Yeah. Um, but soy is a complete protein. So is quinoa. Um, Soy will probably like things like tofu and edamame will have a little better, um, protein content, like overall grams of protein per serving than Mm -hmm. something like quinoa. Um, you know, nuts are great, but nuts really fit into the fat column too. And so they, they do have protein in them, but they do have a lot of fat. And so, Mm -hmm. um, when we look at a portion of nuts and the protein you actually get out of that serving size, um, you know, it's, yes, everything adds up, but I wouldn't put that at like the top of my list, um, for at least for not for a lean protein for sure. Um, let's see some of the other, I mean, there's a variety of like, um, the products we just talked about pea protein is actually making a really big splash in the food industry. Yeah. Even like pea Um, protein powders. Yep. Yeah. Pea protein real big right now. Yep. And they have, um, milk alternatives, uh, that are made with pea protein and they have, um, I think even some of those meat alternatives we just mentioned are made with pea protein or variety. So well, it's pretty decent. Like I'm looking here. So a, a cup of peas, you've got eight and a half grams of protein for a vegetable. Mm-hmm. That's insane. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's crazy high. Yeah. You know? It's yeah. a lot. Well, it's Fantastic. a, it's a legume. Yeah. Um, I mean, how many people would eat a cup of peas regularly is another question, which is another thing, another thing I think that people have to understand on a, a very plant strong kind of eating pattern is your, your portion sizes will adjust, Mm -hmm. you know, to get the kinds of nutrients. If you do start eliminating, sorry, eliminating meat, dairy, eggs, some of those other sources of nutrients, you're, you're going to have to, you know, make those up in some ways. And Mm -hmm. so one cup of peas has maybe eight grams of protein, but three ounces of chicken has, you know, 23, 24 grams of protein. And so you you do have to consider the portion size and the amount that you have to eat and include in your diet. And then let's not forget the satisfaction factor. You know, there is, um, you get that what's called a Maillard browning process. It's, it's when meat browns and gets that kind of, you know, the grill marks or that crispiness and it's amazing. Mm-hmm. That can be more difficult to get with vegetables. Um, and with strictly plant-based 
protein sources. And so there's that flavor and satisfaction factor that we have to consider as well. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, another thing that I love to tell people to include is more seeds in their diet. Um, you know, nuts and seeds, we tend to lump them all together, but they do have differences in, um, the, the minerals and the kinds of, you know, fiber, we talked about the healthy gut a few episodes ago, that would be, a, um, a case for adding more nuts and seeds to the diet as well mm -hmm. to feed that gut bacteria. So there's, there's several things that people can do. And this is a good segue into, you know, start experimenting if you want. I mean, if you Just are play. interested in, yeah, in shifting into a more plant-based way of eating, start investigating some recipes. I mean, mm. I think a great place to start is with ethnic cooking. Mm. So Indian cooking and, um, you know, Thai and Vietnamese and even Chinese cooking. Like there's, there's so many cultures around the world that have like centuries of putting wonderful flavor into plant-based dishes that have nothing to do with, right. you know, any, any animal foods. And mm -hmm. so if our Western culture has geared us toward the meat and potatoes, and that's what, you know, constitutes a meal, start branching out a little bit and trying yeah. some new flavors and new varieties and see how that works. Yeah. Yep. So all right. anything else you're uh, done, buddy. Do I look done? <laughs> you look done. Do Michael's I? about to check the F out, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I did notice like the last couple minutes, I was kind of like in and out of focus a little bit. I was like, uh oh, come on, buddy. Stay here. I'm trying to remember <laughs> if there was, I think there was one last thing I wanted to say, but, um, you know, it's probably not important. Um, I think, you know, just to, just to wrap it up, you guys labeling a diet doesn't make it healthy. There's a lot of different ways to eat that are good for you and, and can protect against disease and can be satisfying and can work for you and be sustainable. Um, it's, it's not the elimination of meat and animal foods is necessarily going to help your health. It's the inclusion of more plant foods. Uh, and uh, if you, if you do have, you know, a strong ethical and, you know, um, animal beliefs and concerns and, and environmental concerns that are at play, then totally honor those. Um, I, I know people that are very strict vegetarians at home, but then they go to someone's house for dinner or something and they, um, you know, they kind of modify and adapt and, and will eat whatever is served and mm -hmm. consider, Hey, this is one meal, um, that has already been prepared and cooked anyway. So it's right. not like they're contributing to that. So, you know, just, um, I would say, keep an open mind and, and really be honest about, yeah, about you and what works for you. Okay. One last thing. What's your favorite, uh, vegetarian plant-based meal. Ooh, let's do all veggie would, meal, all veggie meal. Oh man. Come on. So Put you on the spot. I make an Ethiopian red lentil dish that is awesome. And we usually serve it. I mean, I might serve it with rice, but sometimes I just serve it with roasted cauliflower. It's just two items. It's just a pot of lentils and uses some you know, various spices and mm -hmm. serve it over roasted cauliflower. It's fantastic. Mm. Very filling. Um, that sounds good. lots of protein, good carbs in the lentils too, um, makes leftovers <laughs> and the leftovers taste fantastic because the flavors get a chance to marry and right. it's great. Mm -hmm. I might need you to send me that. That sounds good. I will send it to you. Okay. Do you have a favorite? Uh, yeah. Nacho cheese Doritos. Okay. Yeah, that's well, probably my favorite plant based. That would be vegetarian, meal. not. Yeah. Vegan. Well, vegetarian. Yeah. It works, right? <laughs> I like how you wrinkle your nose when you say, that. <laughs> of course it is. It's fine. <laughs> There's no meat. Oh, <laughs> no. boy. Um, yeah. No, probably just like a, like a vegetables too. Um, I really like a veg good vegetables too. That is nice and satisfying. Mm -hmm. Very. You don't even. I mean, you can throw beef in there for a beef vegetable and it's fantastic, but you don't need it. I think you're just dreaming of putting something, some warm liquid in your belly. Like I think you're tub. still traumatized. Like yeah. I just want to get a tub of, you, a tub of stew. stew. Yeah. And just <laughs> stay there till I eat that's it all. Great. That's great. Yeah. That's really nice. <laughs> <laughs> Michael's fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm getting delirious, I think. 
Do you have a meaning in the mundane? Oh us? man, do we, I? Are you ready I'm for I'm sure it? you've got a whole list of them. Electricity. <laughs> <laughs> Running <laughs> water. God. Like just to like go the in a room and comforts. turn on the light, you know, it's like, oh, thank God. Because all week long you're going and turn on lights that don't yeah. work and you're going to run water just because that's what you do. It's just a habit. Even though I've done it 20 times already, you know, I'm looking at the clock on the microwave. Oh, it's not there. Oh yeah. Duh. And so now to have those things working, it's just, it's mm-hmm. really nice. <laughs> I believe it. And I know I understand, I'm, you know, this is, uh, you know, uh, what do they call it? First world problems. First world problems. Yeah. <laughs> but man, it's really nice to, well, to you know, have that because it sucks. It's a, it. it's a little more than a first world problem. If sure, really, we're talking about like it's the dead of winter mm-hmm. and you do have temperatures that are cold enough that yeah, I mean, people, um, people can freeze. And, yeah. um, you know, if you don't have uh, our society is geared toward like, you know, safe drinking water relies mm-hmm. on electricity and, mm-hmm. you know, certain food, um, yeah. you know, cooking, if you, if you don't have access to go run out and get some things that are easy to eat without electricity, then you're kind of, you know, so, so it is yeah. a little more than a first world problem there. Yeah, that's true. So, yeah. <laughs> but, and just, I mean, this, uh, this isn't really maybe like typically how we do the meat and the mundane, but I'm just really thankful that we're out of that. And that, you know, my, my girls had a safe warm place to go and and i'm really glad they're back here now so yeah yeah i'm glad too thank you how about yeah. you yeah i went skiing last weekend and it was right after uh probably two days of snow so everything is just blanketed in snow especially on the mountain really pretty out very peaceful mm-hmm. i don't know if you notice but like the the quiet that you get when after a fresh snowfall, because Mm -hmm. all of the noise is just kind of absorbed into the snow. Mm -hmm. And so I'm up there on the mountain and I would just stop because I'm doing this long climb and I would just stop and I'd watch, you know, this, the ski lift across the other Ridge kind of just going up and down and just observe the trees and be really peaceful in the moment. And I suddenly hear just this, um, very rhythmic, like chirp. It almost sounded like a squeak like if you're riding a bike and there's like a squeak mm-hmm. at one point in the chain. And so there's almost like this like very rhythmic. To it. Like, yeah. And I was huh. like, what is that? And I stop and I'm listening and I finally turn around and look up in this tree and there's a bird perched on the very tip top of the tree. Like I could see it just perched way up there. And I can only imagine what this bird's world looked like from up there. <laughs> I bet it was amazing. And it's just chirping. And it's the only, the only sound on the entire mountain. Cause I, I mean, there weren't a lot of people out and mm. I was there by myself and just me and this little bird. And it was just a really cool little, that's pretty you know, great observation of, yeah. of nature and just this, you know, bird. I mean, maybe it, he was bitching about all the snow. I don't know. But to, in my mind, it was, this bird is so happy to He's be out like, here too. What the? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that was mine. It was great. Uh, I actually put it on my Instagram story. I can send you the little video if you want. Yeah. Please you do. probably didn't get to see much Instagram this last week. Oh, God, I couldn't do it. I couldn't even like hardly contact clients. It was so frustrating. Oh. I couldn't make calls for like three days. Yeah. yeah, it's over. It's over. Yay. It's a, yeah. like a bad dream. Mm-hmm. So speaking of Instagram, if you want to follow us on Instagram, we are at middleish underscore podcast. Um, get on there and, you know, message us. You can email us at middleish, yeah. yeah, middleish at gmail.com. Um, we actually have a new supporter that we I wanted do. to give a shout out to my buddy, Brian Weisinger. Thank yeah. you so much, Brian and Kim yep, we really for supporting the podcast. That. And, um, as this grows and as we get the support, we are really hopeful that we're going to bring some cool stuff to the Yep. the table and expand this thing. So yep. your support thank you means so much. We can do things like just, I mean, just one, just spread the message of metalish. Cause we really feel like this is, in, it's imperative to have this kind of approach to sustainability and long-term health, but also just be able to do some fun stuff. Like, you know, start to do some merch and that kind of stuff for you guys. Um, we have some really fun ideas that we'd like to do. So your support is, it's very much appreciated. Yes. Thank you. And uh, thanks for listening and have a great day. 